We now move on to our next plenary session by Dr. Hemant Vakankar on prosthetic joint infection. Dr. Hemant M. Vakankar works at the Dinanant Mankeshkar Hospital in Pune. He specializes in revision knee arthroplasty. Thank you for being here, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, at the outset, let me thank uh, the organizers of this wonderful meeting and all the efforts uh, that have gone in. I think uh, to, to organize life surgery is uh, no, no mean task, and I'm sure they have done a wonderful job here. My uh, brief is to talk on prosthetic joint infection, and uh, this, as we all know, is, I think, a catastrophic uh, you know, problem that uh, most of us uh, do end up facing from time to time. Any surgeon who says that I don't have a prosthetic joint infection is God, is either lying or simply doesn't do any joint replacements. So it's, it's a universal problem that we all face with. In the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to uh, deal with a variety of aspects that, uh, uh, that, that are associated. A small word about prevention. I think anybody who has a significant infection rate uh, ought to look at his own infrastructure and in his own practices. Anybody who thinks that the infection rate is, say, above 1% in today's day and age should visit other centers, look at the practices, look at the protocols, look at the infrastructure, and see how they can change. And I think we need to look within ourselves. Any patient who has infection within the first three to six months after surgery, a surgeon has to take a certain blame and certainly need to look within to change ourselves and improve our practices. I think we need to f focus on two aspects of uh, infected arthroplasty. First is diagnosis and obviously the management. Uh, a small note to say that every painful total knee arthroplasty is not an infected uh, arthroplasty, but most infected total joint arthroplasties are painful. And the diagnosis can be quite obvious with discharging sinuses uh, or even uh, cellulitis like this, or it could be deceptively subtle and is a subtle cases that we really need uh, careful attention. I think early diagnosis is absolutely crucial for maximizing the chances of success, and you certainly need high index of suspicions, especially in patients who are, say, immune compromised, is diabetes, rheumatoids. They may not have all the systemic signs uh, that a typical infection presents. Uh, any patient who has unexplained constant post-operative pain, I think the infection uh, suspicion has to be there uh, high on the list. Early component loosening in absence of any malposition certainly or instability certainly you know, should uh, present this infection as a number one possible diagnosis. Microbiology is absolutely critical and it's absolutely vital to identify the organism. And uh, if you have the services of infection disease specialist uh, available locally, I think it's, it's, it's a great uh, boon. Uh, because, you know, uh, uh, they do have certain insights into certain specific infections, the way they behave, the, the way they present, the way the cellulitis presents, uh, and certainly has been helpful in, in my practice uh, in past. Unfortunately, our great infection disease specialist has migrated to U.S., and uh, we have a problem with that. Uh, because there is certainly a narrow window for infection eradication, uh, especially in acute scenario, uh, for before the biofilm or the slimy layer that develops uh, in these situations. History is important. Any patient who presents uh, from somewhere else, and it's always, always easy to treat with somebody else's infection than your own infection. Because any, your own patient following up to you uh, with uh, symptoms and uh, infection is not high on the agenda. But somebody else's patient comes to you with painful arthroplasty, it's certainly, you know, number one diagnosis. You need to look into the history because wound healing problems, any discharging sinus immediately after surgery, patient being taken back to theater very soon after surgery, all of these are pointers uh, that, that this could certainly be uh, infection. Any use of prolonged antibiotics uh, by the index, uh, following the index surgery, all of these are pointers that should uh, suggest that it could well be the infection. Again, in general, pain on weight bearing and relief at rest usually suggests mechanical loosening of the processes, whereas pain at rest or at night, which is activity related, usually suggests either inflammatory or infective uh, process. So this is just a stand general uh, observation that you have with these patients. The typical classification that is described is any uh, first is early post-operative infection within first three months after index surgery, late chronic infections within first two years or even later after surgery, Third is acute hematogenous infection, which is sudden late onset. You know, these patients usually throw a septic embolus from somewhere else and are present with an acute hematogenous infection. There are two more categories that were added on later on. One is positive intraoperative culture. When you're not expecting uh, any infection and you just send off a sample as a routine and it comes back as infection. And third, last one that was described by Rodriguez was late incisional cellulitis. Uh, 
Let's consider early post-operative infection. These patients usually present like an acute infection with erythematous, uh, draining, painful joint. Uh, they may have fever, cellulitis, or even high WBC counts. And uh, a word of caution in these situations is that not every leaking wound is an infected knee. Many times patient who has immune compromised or patients who are rheumatoids with low albumin uh, and nutritionally deficient, these patients can have serious ooze like you see here, a clear yellow fluid that oozes from these uh, wounds sometimes. And most of these patients usually tend to settle down uh, just with rest alone and uh, you know, not being so aggressive with mobilization. So this is a serious watery discharge without any inflammation, without any significant pain. This is usually uh, edema fluid or liquefied fat that sort of oozes from the wound. And uh, all these patients need is some extra time and delayed mobilization. And in, but any leaking wound that is inflamed and not settling down with the mobilization alone beyond eight to 10 days ought to be debrided and lavaged. I think I have never regretted taking a patient back uh, to theater early enough because most of these uh, cases do have uh, either hematoma that is getting infected or infection itself. Now, hematoma itself is a presents a peculiar problem because in the era of uh, using extensive anticoagulation, you do have patients who, uh, whose uh, joints would look angry and most of these are uh, because of hematomas that, that are developed. But most of these knees are not so painful. And if you obviously keep a watch on them, you, you know, you can uh, check their uh, WBC counts. And uh, if they're not very high, they're not painful, you can certainly observe them, like uh, this patient. It would gradually settle down. It's a hematoma that doesn't always need intervention or an evacuation. So hematoma also presents a similar or peculiar problem. But any post-operative infection that, uh, you know, is, uh, you know, uh, acute and uh, uh, wound is leaking, do not procrastinate. Early debridement uh, and washout with uh, prosthetic retention is really uh, the key for this. Uh, during uh, surgery, you need to do a complete synovectomy, even poly exchange to get the, to the back of the knee if it is the knee. Uh, hip, obviously, you can dislocate and give a thorough uh, lavage and uh, debridement. And uh, it's important that you take multiple samples uh, during surgery uh, for tissue culture and uh, hope that it will grow something because patients uh, uh, invariably are on antibiotics at this stage. Is the late chronic infection that is a problem because the findings are not always obvious. Uh, they may or may not have a draining illness and may not present with any systemic uh, symptoms at all. But most of them do have pain at rest. I think that is a recurring feature. And diagnostic protocol uh, includes history and examination. The first thing uh, one does is uh, send patients for ESR and CRP. And if these are uh, positive, especially both are positive, certainly aspirate the knee, uh, aspirate the hip or the knee for culture. And this has to be done uh, in a sterile manner, uh, preferably under uh, X-ray control if it is a hip and uh, the knee can be done on an outpatient basis. Uh, and obviously later on if you're taking the patient back to theater for debridement or for obviously intraoperative frozen sections and tissue cultures. There are newer diagnostic modalities, I'll be uh, touching upon them in, in a short while. Clinical examination of these patients uh, may or may not have inflamed joints. All of these signs may or may not be present. So, so first thing is ESR and CRP. A combined normal CRP and ESR, I think, reliably rules out infection. I think that there are several uh, papers that have uh, come out uh, suggesting this. But when both are positive, it is, I think probability of infection is very high, as high as almost 83%. Uh, isotope scans are virtually given up today. I'm just mentioning this to say that uh, nobody ever uses isotope scans anymore because they're costly, time consuming, and again, uh, are not reliable. The next step, if the ESR-CRP is positive, is synovial fluid aspiration. And in that, you're looking for a w WBC count and differential WBC count. This is the most direct and predictable and fairly simple thing to do, uh, especially for the knees. Uh, obviously, hip needs certain more uh, elaborate preparation, taking the back patient to theater and maybe even uh, ultrasound guided or under image intensifier guided, you need to do an aspiration. The technique and sample handling is pretty important because false positive rates can be as high as 15%. And this paper by Javed uh, Parvizi's group, uh, in fact, brought down this uh, uh, identified cutoff marks and cutoff level significantly. I think today the WBC count uh, of uh, 1,100 plus and uh, more than 64% polymorphonuclear cells uh, is suggestive of infection in, in these patients. Mind you, these we are talking about uh, chronic or delayed infections. We are not talking about acute scenario at all. Uh, when both are below this cutoff, the negative predictive value is almost 98%. But when both are above uh, cutoff, uh, positive predictive value is again 98%, which is uh, extremely high. Uh, 
uh, whenever the patient is on antibiotics uh, prior to the aspiration, it is better if the patient stops antibiotics at least for two weeks for, because that certainly gives you higher uh, possibility of getting a culture positive. And if somebody is on antibiotics but does not have any systemic uh, signs, it's better to stop the antibiotics because pumping antibiotics is never going to be the solution in these patients. Antibiotic treatment without establishing diagnosis should certainly be avoided. Leukocyte stress test is uh, what uh, was advised some years back, but again, uh, the reliability rate or sensitivity rate is only 85%. It's similar to a urinary dipstick. Uh, you just aspirate the knee, and in the fluid, you have this uh, strip that you dip and check the color like, like uh, a urinary dipstick. And uh, that is what was uh, suggested. But uh, certainly 85% sensitivity and some degree of uh, positivity, especially if you have uh, blood contamination, is a problem with this. So leukocyte resistance test never really became uh, very popular. The latest on the market, on the, on the horizon, especially India is concerned, is Sinovisure, which, is, uh, which was originally you know, developed by CD Diagnostics that was taken over by Zimmer later on. So in India, I think it is awaiting uh, government clearance and it will, I think, soon be available, I'm told. It's a basically a uh, test to uh, detect alpha defensive, which is the peptide that is secreted by the neutrophils in, in uh, response to the infections. And it is extremely sensitive. It is 97% sensitive and 96% specific for infection. And uh, such a high degree of sensitivity specificity has been tested in uh, several papers today. And I think we are all awaited the introduction of this test, uh, um, you know, in India. It is like a urinary pregnancy test. And all you need to do is aspirate the fluid and put the fluid on this, uh, on this bug, uh, strip that you're seeing here. And within a matter of few minutes, you get this uh, result as positive or negative. And uh, as you, would you believe it that this is as, as simple as, you know, such a simple test being introduced and this is a fantastic new tool uh, in, this, uh, you know, in the hands of arthroplasty surgeons today. In, in fact, US, they're offering what is called a Sinovisure panel, which includes the Sinovisure test itself. But remember, NICE sensitivity was 96%. So they are even trying to look at those 4% that are, uh, you know, not uh, being picked up by this. And uh, they are combining a uh, Sinovisure uh, test that I described just now along with a Sinovil fluid CRP level and Sinovil fluid hemog hemoglobin level. The simple reason for this is even those 4% of patients who are being missed by this test, uh, they tend to, uh, you know, uh, ha this happens pr practically because of uh, contamination of blood in the Sinovil fluid. And whenever this happens, if they take these two elements out and compare, the, get this test, I think they can give you a much uh, higher predictive value. I think they want to get it as high as uh, close to 100% uh, sensitive. And this is what is being offered, at least in the US and the Western world today. So we look forward to this introduction of this test. Otherwise, we are looking at uh, the old uh, ways of diagnosing, like intraoperative gram staining, which is, again, uh, very specific, but had very poor sensitivity and uh, certainly had uh, high false negative rates, uh, especially with organisms of low virulence. In intraoperative frozen sections uh, is, again, uh, been popular, but uh, you certainly need a good pathologist uh, to diagnose this. Uh, it was the specimens that used to be uh, that are collected from uh, the most inflamed tissue during surgery. It's usually the synovium, uh, various th three or four sides that three to five sides that you collect. And under high micro high uh, power uh, microscopy, you need to look for polymorphonuclear uh, cells, and you count these cells in per high power field. And if it is more than ten, it's certainly high predictive for infection. It is less than 5, it is inconsistent with infection, but again, the big gray area is 5 to 10 uh, PMNs per high power field. And again, it, it boils down to a good pathologist and as well as uh, your clinical uh, perception. So frozen section, although it's been reported and widely used, again, uh, has a problem in these uh, gray areas. Interoperative tissue culture, I think, are extremely important because uh, you need to send the tissues as well as swab during surgery. Uh, it's again advisable to send minimum three swabs from most inflamed areas for uh, culture. Uh, removed implants, uh, especially the interfaces, ought to be swabbed and sent for culture. All cultures have to be incubated at least for five days, and if still nothing grows at the end of five days, a prolonged culture may be necessary for certain low virulence organisms. The false positive rate reported uh, is about 6 to 13 percent. So treatment options in uh, once you establish that it is infected include uh, first is prosthetic retention with antibiotic suppression or uh, and or open debridement and uh, otherwise you're talking about one stage revision or a two stage revision. Uh, 
Antibiotic suppression alone is advised only for very elderly, medically unfit patients, and it can be successful only in, uh, if the organism is of low virulence, if the components are not loose, and patients can certainly tolerate uh, antibiotics for a long term. Otherwise, antibiotic suppression in itself is, uh, doesn't work in the long run. Debridement with prosthetic retention, it can be done if uh, the history is very short, if it's an acute infection, and uh, it can certainly, you know, if you go in uh, before the, the biofilm develops, and uh, that is a window, small window of about uh, five to ten days that we're looking at, and if you're delayed, then biofilm develops, and in the, you know, one stage uh, debridement alone uh, without, uh, without taking out the prosthesis doesn't work. Poly exchange and liner exchange in knee is common. You need to lavage uh, with a lot of uh, saline, and uh, there is approximately about 33% uh, uh, success rate reported uh, in 2002. So the, it, it ultimately will boil down to single stage or a two stage revision. I think there are very few centers in the world that are offering uh, single stage revision, and the success rate uh, being uh, quoted is anywhere from 70 to even, I think, recently 90%. And that's the single most center that is the following this is endoclinic in Germany. Uh, but I think virtually everywhere else in the world, I think uh, people are uh, scared of doing single stage surgery for the risk of reinfection, obviously, uh, because the success of two stage revision is, uh, is as high as uh, 89 to 100 percent. And uh, whenever it comes to two stage revision, the first stage involves, uh, you know, removal of prosthesis and all foreign material. Uh, ideally, this, this was a you know, policy the not to give antibiotics until the specimens are obtained during surgery, but there was recently a paper again which suggested that you can give patients uh, and, uh, the pre-op loading antibiotic dose prior to going in for the first stage because that has shown that it doesn't affect uh, the intraoperative tissue cultures uh, that are obtained. And uh, you certainly can give antibiotics uh, according to the recent paper. Removal of components and cement is done while preserving the bone stock. Uh, that is the first step of the surgery and complete debridement with cyanovectomy. And uh, one needs to put a cement spacer with antibiotics. And antibiotics, you know, the, the most uh, common antibiotic being used is vancomycin uh, because it is heat stable. The standard, uh, you know, policy is to use four grams of vancomycin per gram of per packet of cement. Uh, these are kind of samples that are taken, fluid is taken, a swab is taken from the prosthesis and obviously tissues uh, samples being sent. And uh, you, one can either have a choice of using uh, antibiotic loaded cement spacer or using a prostalac, prost you know, cement, uh, the pre-loaded, pre-antibiotic loaded prosthesis uh, made up of cement that is called prostalac. And this is uh, available both for hips and knees. You today have uh, availability of even the molds that you can make during surgery and those can be used as uh, interim uh, prosthesis. So uh, this uh, again is expensive, prostalac and uh, uh, but do give certain uh, range of flexion uh, as against uh, using a block which does not give you any range of flexion at all. So this is the kind of processes uh, that is, uh, you know, preloaded uh, with antibiotics uh, that can be used. Uh, just an example here, this is at the end of debridement and this is the processes without uh, being cementing. When you come to cementing these processes in, you don't want really a good interdigitation because you're going to come back two months later or six weeks later uh, and take this out. So you do not want to lose bone when you take this process like out. And so it is a very late cementing and very fluffy kind of loose kind of cementing that is done. And uh, that is the way it looks on a post-operative x-ray. And uh, when you come back uh, six weeks later, uh, this is uh, on exposure of the joint and it can come out very nicely. You should ideally have a membrane that is formed that suggests that no bone is being compromised when you take this uh, cement uh, spacer out. And that is the way it looks. Uh, and this is a revision. Some examples of uh, using these uh, principles and protocols, a patient who has got uh, discharging sinus obviously infected, and this is on exposure. You can see the sinus coming from the tibial side, and this is uh, when I'm using antibiotic loaded cement spacer. I usually use two packets of uh, cement packs. The first pack, I use it on the tibial side and use it on the medullary canal on the femoral side, and second pack, I uh, create a block to go between these two surfaces. My uh, philosophy is that whatever a little movement that takes place between the, you know, in the knee should take place between the, these two uh, cement blocks that I'm putting. And that is how it looks on the post-operative x-ray. And that, uh, I think, works well in my hands. Uh, so between two stages, one needs to give IV antibiotics that are appropriate based on the culture reports. You need to monitor WBC, CRP, and ESR at two weekly intervals. The wound status uh, obviously needs to be looked at.
And uh, at the end of uh, six weeks, uh, I prefer to give a two week of uh, antibiotic free interval and to see if uh, WBC and uh, sorry, ESR, CRP levels are rising again. And if they're not rising and uh, uh, you know, the patient has remained uh, quiescent, we can certainly go ahead and do a second stage of rev revision. A patient is mobilized weight-bearing ambulation uh, uh, for a knee using a plaster cylinder. For the second stage, one needs to have intraoperative swab uh, being sent. Again, that's a separate uh, philosophy. I think we're going to have a revision surgery later on so we can see how the processes are removed. Just to show you some examples of the second stage, uh, the removal of uh, cement should not compromise any bone stock at all. And that is the post-operative x-ray of the same patient. And that is the post-operative, the pre-op uh, sinuses and post-operative, uh, I think, six, six uh, month follow-up of the same patient. So one more example of the same, similar kind of a picture and post-operative x-ray. Uh, this was, again, one more example. You can see multiple discharging sinuses on the knee. Uh, this is on uh, during debridement after retention. You can see the joint is full of pus and the granulation tissue. This is at the end of the debridement. Six weeks of uh, uh, antibiotics and cement spacer block. Coming back to second stage. And uh, just some intraoperative pictures of the reconstruction. Just one minute now. And uh, this is almost a uh, four-year follow-up of the same patient. So the salvage obviously could well be a knee arthrodesis for patients who obviously uh, are not infection not getting controlled or uh, uh, who do not wish to go take that risk of reinfection. And uh, there are various ways of uh, doing this. I'm just going to run through this now. Right. So, so to summarize, I think you need to have a good protocol uh, and uh, I think identification of organism is extremely critical. You need to counsel the patient with the risk of reinfection, which is about 8 to 10 per, uh, percent uh, in this uh, infected knees. Uh, I think two-stage revision is certainly the gold standard as far as I'm concerned and it's certainly a team approach when you deal with these patients. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that excellent talk, sir. I now invite Dr. Ramakrishnan to kindly present the memento to Dr. Hemant. Thank you, sir.